All right, good evening, everyone. I thought I would uh, present this this month since we had some questions last month about the automated material handling system. And um, we can have a little discussion if you want afterwards or answer any questions, but I ask maybe if we can get through the PowerPoint and then we'll have questions at the end. So, all right. What we'll cover, what is an automated material handling system? Why are we considering one? How can we tell if it's worth it? Where are we in the process? And what do we need from our members? First, um, what is an automated material handling system? It's a tool or a system of tools that removes the need for a manual interaction to check in, check out, move or sort materials. I'm going to play a short clip here from the St. Louis County Library. Um, we went on a tour there. I was not able to make it that day. Um, this was last, almost two years ago, I think now. So this is just a very short clip. You can see they're using what's called a book to shoveler on this side of the machine and books are loaded. And then one at a time, the machine brings down a book to be able to be sorted. So you'll see then on the other side, there's an employee standing there also feeding books into the automated material handling system and the machine will only send one book at a time or one item, I should say, even if it's DVDs, it would go through. So the uh, machine there, that's it coming through the other side. And then as you'll see it travel down the conveyor belt there, there's, they actually have their, all their books labeled or their bins labeled. We would be doing multiple different configurations if we had one. So the book would go down, it would go into the appropriate bin for the appropriate library as it's labeled. We would probably be putting labels on the outside of our bins. So we would physically know which library it's going to. And then you can see the status of the, um, each section of the machine on a monitor there that would come with it. So it's easily monitored. That was just a very short clip for that. So why are we considering one? There are many potential benefits for our member libraries. Um, one is a long-term cost savings, and this would be for our share member libraries. An automated material handling system would route items with barcodes instead of labels, thus savings miles of receipt paper tape annually. There's a faster delivery turnaround time after weekends and holidays, so IHLS sorting staff would be able to sort their heavy loads, such as those due to the holidays or long weekends, in a single day versus multiple days, what's currently happening, and this would be eliminating the backlog. There'd be more accurate sorting. While missed sorting isn't common, it does happen. And when an item is sent to the wrong library in another hub, this means it could be over a week before the item ends up in the hands of a patron. The automated material handling system would further reduce this occurrence. We would have pand pandemic resistant sorting. So with the low touch nature of the machines, it would make disruption to future pandemics or similar emergencies far less likely. We would also have more accurate data tracking and statistics. The automated material handling system will allow for the item status to be automatically updated in Polaris. This would allow the library to know exactly where their item is in the transit journey. And there's also a potential for sorting holds and returns for share member libraries. This is a feature that we will need to determine the feasibility on, but share members could elect to have their holds versus their returns sorted in separate bins, allowing for member library staff sort time to be reduced. There are also potential benefits for IHLS. We have reduced long-term long operating costs. Our personnel costs would be reduced through decreased total staff hours needed. This would be likely accomplished by attrition-related staff reductions. Our biggest concern is our staff turnover. We have to frequently hire replacement sorters, and the statistic is taken, I haven't updated it since the last time we did the PowerPoint, but over the last 18 months of the 11 sorter positions across IHLS hubs, we have lost and needed to retrain one sorter on average of every two months. So there's a definite cost to IHLS for that. It's about $1,000 per sorter for onboarding costs and the administrative cost of onboarding and training. And this does not include anything to do with the termination costs whenever that employee leaves. As I've stated previously with the other slide, the faster delivery turnaround on the weekends and holidays, that's a benefit to us as well. Then the increased efficiency through increased, increased speed. The number of items sorted per hour would be much higher than manual sort. 
This would help staff ensure that all items are being able to be sorted every day. The typical automated material handling system can sort on average 2,000 items per hour, and the current IHLS manual sorting can average 350 to 400 items per hour. So that's a big change in the sorting speed. There's also a reduced likelihood of chronic injury. Sorting bins can be adjusted to the employee's heights, so this provides a safer and ergonomically adjustable workstation for the staff, preventing injuries and workers' compensation claims. And there would be no major changes to our current infrastructure. The machines that we are considering require one single outlet and one data cable. This means that IHLS would not need to undergo any major changes to install these machines. And one vendor that we're looking at reports that their machine at peak operation use less energy than, or I'm sorry, less than half of the energy used by a typical hairdryer. So is it worth it? How much will it cost IHLS? How much will it cost member libraries? And how long will it take to see a return on investment? We are in the request for proposal stage and the RFP will allow us to determine the exact cost of an automated material handling system for all three locations. In fall of 2022, based on the request for information responses we received, we learned that costs could range anywhere from 250,000 to 500,000 for the unit at the Edwardsville location, but that depended on the vendor. For the fees, how much will it cost member libraries? IHLS member libraries do not pay fees to be a member of IHLS. Therefore, members would not see any fees related to the purchase or the operation of the automated material handling system. We do not plan for any portion of these costs to be passed along to SHARE member libraries either, as SHARE would not be paying for the automated material handling system, IHLS would. What about other costs? The only possible costs that we anticipate from libraries are the material and labor involved in rebarcoding items. And there's some criteria here that if and only if it applies to. If you're a SHARE member library and you do not have barcodes items on the inside of your items and you do not have an RFID tag, the barcodes must be on the outside if you do not have an RFID tag. And if those items are circulated outside of your library, we will only need to rebarcode items that are circulated outside of your library. So it's not in the entire collection at one time that needs to be rebarcoded, it would be as they're circulating. Um, IHLS staff are currently evaluating how many libraries this will affect. Some libraries have indicated that they would like the help of IHLS staff to rebarcode their items using our barcode duplicators. And some libraries have indicated that they would like to just borrow those barcode duplicators and have their own staff accomplish this task. We have heard positive reviews from libraries in other states that have utilized these barcode duplicators that have not reported any major issues with their barcodes. Um, and I should mention here as well, we're planning on hopefully doing a short survey um, in the next couple of months to be able to get more definite answers on the rebarcoding process because we need that information for the return on investment. So how will IGLS pay for it? We've got grants. We've also got a healthy general fund reserve balance that we anticipate to be able to pay for that. The return on investment. This will be calculated by IHLS finance and operations staff after we receive results on the RFP. The current estimate is seven years and the machines typically last from anywhere from 10 to 15 years. Um, but some customers have reported that their machines are still in full operation and they're nearing the 20 year mark. All right, so where are we? The first stage was to do staff research and is issue the request for information to determine what an automated material handling system would look like at the Edwardsville Hub. In the second stage, we brought in member libraries to form an automated material handling working group, do more research on member libraries' needs and the actual machine capabilities. And then the decision was made to move forward on issuing the request for proposal so we could determine exact costs. We are currently in stage three, and I'll review more on the next slide here. So in October of this year, we began working with the consultant to write the RFP. This includes the circulation data analysis, um, configuration, workflow, determining the number of sort stations we would need, as well as an automated material handling system implementation plan for the RFP. And we need this for the RFP because we need to be able to provide to the vendors what our timeline might look like. So they're well aware that they would need to be providing training for three different locations and so many months apart. So we're still in that stage right now, coming up with the implementation plan. 
And then as well, he'll be doing the RFP development, the RFP communications with vendors, and he'll also be coming here to do the site visits with the vendors at each three of our locations. In January, we expect to post the RFP and complete the additional rebar coding analysis. And in April, the results of the RFP will be posted and the ROI return on investment will be completed. In May, the AMH will then be presented to the IHLS board for the final decision, but we do plan to have the numbers for April for the first read of the budget as well. Okay, so what do we need for our members? Soon we'll be posting a savings calculator on our website, so we'll need volunteers to help us provide some examples of the estimated savings. We'll need help determining rebar coding plans. How, how many libraries will this affect? Who will need our assistance? We'll need to include the staff time on our return on investment calculations to determine the feasibility of this. The barcoding placement communications will be very important. In a delivery survey last year, many participated participants indicated that if formal guidance on barcode placement was developed, a vote by members would be the best method to determine placement. We also need help with this container level check-in. This was an additional purchase feature that would be no benefit to IHLS at all, but it would only be a benefit to potentially some member libraries. So we wanna verify that this would be worth us purchasing if we decided to do that. All right, if you are interested in helping or have questions or concerns, please reach out to me. Um, I'll go ahead and go to the next slide there. There's a whole section on our website that's dedicated to this project with a lot of frequently asked questions as well. I've of course covered some of most of them here, but there's more information on the website. So last slide, that's it I have for today. What questions do we have? Good job, Emily. Thank you. I guess I was wondering when the AMH committee, my understanding was that they had two recommendations, one to either forget about this project or one to take it to the board to decide if they wanted to continue. I wondered how that jumped to going ahead and getting the RMP. Yeah, so the, when, they, when that was the recommendation presented to the board, it was decided to go ahead and add it to the budget so we could continue, because at that time when it was discussed at that board meeting, we decided we need more information. There was no way for us to make a decision yes or no based on a request for information on only the Edwardsville location because certainly while Champaign is similar to Edwardsville, the Carbondale cost would be, not be similar at all to what Champaign and Edwardsville would be. So we need more definite numbers to be able to determine whether or not it makes sense to move forward. So all this RFP is doing right now is just getting exact cost on what it would look like for the machines. Doing the RFP does not mean we're moving forward. Okay, well, I was concerned because 28000 for consultant fees is high and about the AMH committee. I know our particular library, a changeover like this would uh, cost us about $4,000. So um, that is something to think about for small libraries. Yep, absolutely it is. So that's, I'm hoping that all member libraries will be able to complete that survey so we can have accurate data for how much rebar coding we'll be able to be doing for other people so we can have an accurate gauge on what we need to prepare for if we do decide to move forward. So, so yeah. Colleen, this is Kevin. I, I have a lot of questions, tons. Um, I'm just going to point out a couple. You said that we'll reduce chronic injury. How many days a year do we lose to workers' comp injuries? Jill, do you want to speak to that at all? I mean, I don't know what kind of information we can provide. Yeah. Um, a general number. That's not, that's not a violation in any way. Yeah, I mean, months. Yeah. We, months. months. Yeah. We have, yes, yeah, months. Um, we have 40 pound tubs that disorders lift, um, and that does. Um, cause injury and also just with them moving and the way they're moving, putting okay. the items on the shelves. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, I don't know, I, again, I've said this before and I'll say it again, long-term cost savings until you show me numbers, that's just the words, that doesn't mean anything. Faster. Yeah. faster delivery, I don't know how you get faster by using a machine because the, the bottleneck on this, on all of these deliveries is the drivers. 
So there's, it doesn't matter how fast you process, you still got a day to, dr to drive them around. So I don't understand how that equates. I um, can't speak to that a little bit. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, and then the other thing is the accuracy. I don't know what's the percentage of errors that we're seeing now. Okay, yep. I can speak on both of those. So okay. as far as the faster sorting, right now we're experiencing a lot higher volumes than we've been having. I mean, we're back to increased above pre-COVID numbers. So mm -hmm. our sorters are sometimes like, they're probably wrapping it up now. There's And they're still not even probably getting everything sorted. So they're still... 30, 40s tubs some days that are left, at least here in Edwardsville. I'm seeing that every day. Um, so there's a backlog. I remember when I first started as a facilities director, there were some tubs that were sitting there for like five days because we just couldn't get to them. So there's certainly a backlog of items and member library or the actual patrons are seeing those wait times. There's some times where I remember I request an item and you wait. And I know there's the waiting time for it to actually be available. But then there's also the wait time of going from one hub. So, and then when I'm talking about like that miss sort, sometimes it's accidentally sent, a person's visually looking at it, and you get tired after reading those same items. After say, I mean, I was back there sorting and I was making mistakes. It's going to happen. So you send it to the wrong hub and then they get it back and then they have to send it back to us and then it goes to the library. It can take time whenever those miss sorts do happen. And it does occur because we're all human. We're going to make mistakes. So, yeah. And I absolutely agree with you with the numbers thing. I, I'm a big numbers person myself. So I absolutely want to make sure it makes sense to before we're moving forward with this. So when you talk about a seven year payback, does that, are you also factoring in the, the maintenance costs? Because I can't imagine. Absolutely. And so that return on investment was calculated, estimating that all the machines would be at the highest, the higher vendor which at the, when we got the RFI results, we've got um, responses from four different vendors. So at that time, we've kind of went through the vendors and did the pros and cons of each vendor. And I will so say that one of the ones that I liked the best was more one of the lower cost machines, but that was only for the Edwardsville. We don't know what the cost would be like for Champagne or Carbondale. And Carbondale is a much smaller sorting volume. So I do anticipate that the total costs do not be as high as what we were originally estimating on the return on investment. Um, but yeah, it all comes down to, I mean, if you think about currently we're spending, like, for example, maybe in Edwardsville, 21 hours a day with all the combined sorting staff, and we may be reducing it down to eight hours a day. So if you just do the basic math of that, 20, 20 hours minus eight. That's the savings you're seeing each day on personnel hours, potentially. Now yeah, that's, those, that's, I don't have those numbers, numbers. Just thrown out a number here, so. Yeah, no, those numbers are still people. And so I don't want to forget that fact that right. people rely on their jobs here. And I don't want to just say, oh, we're saving money. That's great because I think we have a responsibility to our folks. Absolutely. Do you know, Colleen, this is Sarah um, at Lakeland. Do you know when you'll be coming back to the board? Do you think it'll be January or February to do another yes, similar presentation? April. So in January, when we release the RFP, it's going to be like a couple month process. So we release it and then there's a, like a questionnaire period where we, it's like 30 questions we send to the vendors and they send them back to us and they reply. And then we also do virtual, we're gonna do a site visit at each hub as well, and that will be in February. And then we're also going to do a virtual online question and answer session for the vendors as well. So I think the responses in that timeline are not set to be due back until end of March, maybe it was mid to end of March. So we won't even have the RFP um, results until March. And then at that time, we'll be able to complete that return on investment our consultant is planning on presenting um, a report to the full board, and then we'll bring the ROI and return on investment and his consultant report at the same time. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any more comments or questions? I'm gonna say that I understand this a lot better. Good. Your presentation. Yes. A big and thanks I, to Shandy, Grief Finrod. She helped me I, I <laughs> make see, it clear. I see the need so much more. Yep. Good.